The background uh, to this session is uh, some work that's been done by the CSIRO and uh, I'll ask one of the authors of that to briefly explain the background and uh, some of the conclusions from that uh, in a second. But first I want to introduce the rest of the panel and I'm sure some of them are quite familiar to you. Um, firstly, uh, Matt Liniger, who's previously the Executive Director of the National Farmers Federation, now CEO of the Australian Rural Leadership Foundation. Um, so Matt, welcome. Um, Associate Professor Richard Heath. Richard's uh, uh, a farmer, well sorry, uh, from a family of farming uh, on the Liverpool Plains and now has a role with the University of Sydney particularly in relation to their Narrabri facility, which they're expanding. And uh, so Richard's uh, coming from both a production background, but also from an education and training uh, background. David Pearce uh, is a senior economist um, with, or, or executive director, in fact, of the Centre for International Economics. And David's been uh, very heavily involved in uh, an enormous body of economic research, looking at the implications of uh, policies and uh, changes in the Australian economy over an extended period of time, so uh, a wealth of knowledge there. Uh, Richard has just introduced himself, and finally, um, and not the least, uh, Stefan Heikovic, who's the Principal Scientist Strategy and Foresight at the CSIRO, and uh, Stefan was the uh, lead author, if you like, or, or the collaborator of the team that put together the base document, and he's going to explain in a very summarised fashion um, the conclusions of that, and that'll be the basis of the discussion that will follow. So I'd ask Stefan to come and uh, give us a bit of an overview of the, um, the main findings and the main conclusions of that research. Thanks very much, Mick. So with our colleagues at RURDIC about uh, halfway through last year, we had a look at this issue and uh, felt that a, a contribution to be made to the landscape of Australian rural industries was to do a horizon scanning project to look forward. And we gave ourselves roughly a 20 year time frame about change that was on its way that we could help, um, help Australia seize opportunities and, and manage risk in a, in a rapidly changing world. We used a foresight process we developed at CSIRO which uh, involves casting a very wide net over all trends that we think are potentially relevant. So a trend is a pattern of change and it has directionality. It has to be going up or down or moving. So it's not just a background issue, but something that puts agriculture in a different space to where it is today. Uh, the trends can be geopolitical, economic, social, environmental or technological. A GIST framework was used to classify them. We then bring those trends together and where they intersect and create a more significant or deep set trajectory of change, we get a mega trend. And those mega trends are shown in a Venn diagram behind me here. And these are the big shifts that we th see happening for Australian agriculture over the coming 20 years. It is a draft product. We are still working on it. So it's actually a good time to get uh, feedback from an excellent audience like yourselves here in terms of how our thinking is unfolding. But this is the process we've been through so far. To identify all these trends and then through workshops and analysis, bring them together into megatrends and, and bigger shifts. The first of these megatrends is a hungrier world. And this really is a story of growing demand out there for food. The world population goes from 7 billion to 10 billion midway through this century. Most forecasts put it at about that. Um, that's more people eating more food. And um, we ask the questions like, can the world feed itself in there? And what, what role for Australia in that picture? You know, yes, we think the world can feed itself and in innovation will see it go in that direction. But the world's got to make about 70% more food by 2050 than it does today. And that's a big part of this opportunity. Next one is a wealthier world. It's not just more people, but income growth. Incomes grow from around 12,000 US GDP per capita to 44,000 US GDP per capita, which is a big increase in buying power. And we know as Asian people become wealthy, they're diversifying their diets, or a lot of the terminology used is they're westernising their diets. So they don't just eat rice, they're moving to a bunch of diversified products from protein, tropical fruits, nuts, things they didn't previously eat. And this potentially explains why this, this line on the graph called other for Australian exports of agriculture is so very steep, is that we're seeing diversification of what Asian people eat. We also see rises in per capita calorie consumption. So at the lower end of the income scale, as people get a pay rise, they start to eat a lot more food. And 1.02 billion people across Asia go from being poor to middle income class and many shift above. And that's the story that's being told there. Choosy customers is a story about the importance of provenance, ethics, sustainability, health, 
uh, in the foods that we eat, not just for, for Australian markets very much so, but for, for abroad. And we talk about the growth of farmers' markets in there. We talk about the increased concern that the customer has about where my food came from. And the big ticket item as we move towards a, an Australia which is 70% overweight or obese, and we see the issues of um, diabetes type 2 and lifestyle and chronic illness rise, diet is going to play such an important role there. Again, it's not just Australia, this is globally that we see this phenomena, and we will put that health overlay on our food to a much greater extent. But provenance, ethics, sustainability get into there as well, and we want to see that whole supply chain so we know where it came from. Transformative technologies potentially is an answer to some of this. Transformative technologies looks at the growth of synthetics. So we have um, uh, fibre synthetic materials, potentially synthetic foods, as we're able to use genetics and science to make so designer foods that, from, from scratch. Um, but a big focus there is on robotics, artificial intelligence. It can happen on the farm, the, the concept of the automated farm, plus the visibility of the whole supply chain that becomes possible in a world of social media and, and digital technology. Every aspect from farm to fork can be monitored and understood by the consumer. And it's, it could be viewed as a threat because there is a, you know, one of these flying drone robots taking photographs of the farm to see how things were made, or it's from a satellite with, with high levels of resolution. But it's also a massive opportunity to build that provenance link to the customer, to let them see transparently how good the supply chain that's putting the food on their table is. The last one, a bumpy ride, as the Minister said, is we are in for some, some shocks and challenges in the times ahead. The risk profile, you know, risk has always been there for Australian ag, but we reckon into the future some things change that risk profile, and those are global markets and supply chains, the internationalisation of supply chains means a lot more things that agriculture needs has to come from overseas. Uh, and those supply chains involve de destabilised regions like the Middle East. Um, also on a bumpy ride is the climate shocks that we anticipate in the future with more extremes and, and drier weather in parts of the country and wetter weather in other parts of the country. Uh, so the risk profile of Australian agriculture changes as well. That's a bit of a snapshot of the thinking of where it's at. And this picture is, is developing and, and we'll, we'll move towards a final product in coming months and we'll be informed by the discussion we're about to have. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. Um, I guess the first reaction of a lot of people to some of this discussion, and, and there's certainly a lot of it around, is uh, a response to the 70% increase in food production by 2050 sort of number. And so on its, on its bald uh, facts, that sounds like a huge challenge. Yet, um, David, uh, coming from an economist perspective that looks at these numbers and looks at uh, rates of productivity growth, um, that suggests a number somewhere between one and one and a half percent <laughs> increase in productivity per annum. Yeah. So yeah. we talk about it as a task, and yet that doesn't seem much different to what's being done in the last 20 years. No, it's roughly consistent with what agriculture in this country has achieved actually pretty much forever. If you look at the very long-term statistics, depending on which numbers, it's you know around about 2% you can easily get. So if you want to do it all at once, a 70% increase, it sounds impossible, bit by bit. I've, I've also heard it explained that we need to produce in the next... 30 or 40 years, as much food as was in, produced in the last 8,000 years of human history. So it's a massive increase. But if you look at it incrementally, bit by bit, you look in every industry, um, we have steady productivity improvements. Some, some arguments that maybe they're declining a bit, I mean, some of the data is a little bit unclear. It's always hard when people say, well, where's the next breakthrough coming? You can't actually say, right? You don't know exactly where it's coming but you know if you're working on, on lots of different fronts, um, it's quite achievable. And so that, I guess, takes some of the fizz out of uh, the expectations. And in fact, if you looked at those five, that was the positive one and the rest are potential challenges. So, um. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think um, you know, the trends that Stefan have put together, um, some of them are really positive for agriculture, some of them are possibly quite negative, and a whole lot of them are ambiguous. Um, so on the one hand, you've got, yes, big demand increase in Asia. Um, they're going to want higher value products. Does that mean that all farmers will be making a fortune? No, because on the other side, you've got productivity improvements. You've got productivity improvements not just in Australia, but in our competitor nations. Uh, and you've got productivity improvements up and down the value chain. So it's not necessarily the farmer that, that gets the benefits. So maybe something we can talk about in a moment, Mick, is, is you know, so what are the forces, who's going to gain and what determines whether 
a particular farmer in a particular configuration will make a better return or a, or a worse return under these sorts of scenarios that Stefan and his team have put together. So taking it down to a practical level, Richard, uh, given your farming experience and, and your current role uh, in, in imparting knowledge to potential farmers or, or existing farmers, can you see the 1.5% gain per annum in, in the sort of operations you've been involved in? Do you think that's achievable in Australia? Let's forget about the global uh, task and, and just bring it back to more practical reality here on the ground. It's definitely achievable, but we need to be really careful or conscious of um, what, what segments it's being achieved in, because I think there's a danger. So the 1%, for instance, you look at most crops, we're achieving that on a um, yield increase per annum. Most crops are around 1%, maize is a bit higher, 1.5%. Um, we've got a fantastic uh, and mature uh, commercial breeding scene in wheat in Australia now with the endpoint royalty system, um, and which is the envy of the rest of the world really in terms of an open a revenue model for breeding open pollinator crops. Um, and we've got um, you know, really profitable uh, breeding companies. And the result of that now, I heard a statistic the other day that say compared to corn in the, in the US, it really surprised me. There are now uh, 120 plots of research, you know, of breeding plots per 100 tonnes of wheat delivered in Australia, compared to only 100 plots uh, of corn per 100 tonnes of corn delivered in the US. So the scale of what we're doing is starting to really ramp up, and that's, you know, it, it's breeding's a numbers game. Um, the fact that we've got that much going on now, we will continue at the very least to have those increases, um, if not more. But, and there's a, there's a big caveat on this, there's some crops that are missing out. So sorghum and pulses, for instance, are, are zero gain. There's, there's, there's not the, the breeding effort going into there. Now partly that is because um, uh, they're difficult, or sometimes more difficult crops to breed with, but also that same mature market that were created is based around the size of the crop. They're just not big enough crops, these smaller crops, to, to have really mature commercial breeding um, programs around. So what that means is we're sort of reinforcing this lack of diversity in cropping systems. We're not, and, and that to me is a, is a real sleeping issue going forward, that we're tying ourselves into the sort of farming systems that are falling over in the US, for instance, with resistant weeds and, uh, and diseases because their cropping scene is dominated by two or three big global biotechs that have amazing yield increases and do amazing breeding jobs, but with no diversity. Mm. Um, and so I think we need to be really careful that we, we manage to bring that diversity in somehow and to connect, um, to connect some of the, the circles there you know, that comes to some extent into the, um, I forget the terminology now, but the, the choosier consumer or whatever it is, that um, yes, everyone is recognising, it's been talked a lot about in this conference, that uh, consumers are expecting more quality and they're choosing more quality, but they have to pay for it because it will be less profitable for a while to introduce diversity in, into, into farming. Um, and so that convincing consumers that if they want to pay, you know, want in, uh, a, a um, sustainable environment in their farming si system, um, it will come with a cost. Well, they I think it's a real doing, challenge. They seem to be doing it now with products like quinoa and Carly, so yep. uh, maybe we've just got to put a superfood tag on, uh, on some right. of those other crops. And uh, Matt, one of the comments that's often made is that, in fact, those productivity gain rates aren't difficult if all you had to do was lift the bottom half of agriculture at the moment up to the, the frontier, that would be enough to get that sort of gain. But that relies on people, doesn't it? Do you think that one of the critical issues in the future of agriculture in Australia in dealing with some of these is the capacity of the people in the industry, the training that they start off with, the experiences they gain on the way through? Is that, is that an area that is a limiting factor in terms of the ability to meet, meet those sort of challenges and, and, and respond to those demands? Yeah, Mick, I think it is. It, what, an interesting takeout for me in, in reading uh, uh, Stefan's report was really, and it was in this area, I think Richard just mentioned, the, uh, um, the you know, choose your consumer. And, and it's really about the, the rise of the, in my view anyway, the rise of the individual 
Um, so the choice they have, things targeted at an individual, not just a, a market or, or market segment, uh, is very interesting. And as we look towards um, uh, you know, this area about how uh, we're going to, to move forward for rural and, and regional industries and, and agriculture in Australia, uh, it is a question of how to, I guess, not to move against that tide, uh, but, but how to tap into that. So what does that mean? I mean, I've been thinking about that in terms of, uh, obviously, my new role is uh, in terms of leadership. And what, obviously, what we're trying to do within the Rural Leadership Foundation is all around uh, helping to develop leaders uh, and, and build their capacity, ultimately, for the greater good. But what if the question becomes, uh, in terms of getting on in this world, it's not about the greater good, it's about what the individual wants, what the individual consumer wants. So it, it's a tricky one, I think. It's very difficult. Is that a matter of uh, helping build capacity in, in our industries to tap into that successfully? Um, or, you know, I, I, guess, I guess it raises more questions, Mick, than it, than it provides answers. Um, so, you know, getting back to the, the question of capacity, yes, it, it, is always, uh, it is always an issue, but I think it's also uh, about gaining a better understanding from a rural industries perspective of what we're dealing with, of those, you know, what those consumer needs are, and therefore working backwards from there and saying, well, look, you know, which areas do we need to address? Uh, Stefan, uh, taking off your CSIRO hat and becoming Joe Citizen, do we have the, the science and technology infrastructure to be able to do something with some of these? Uh, I mean, it, it often, it's often <coughs> said that you know, our universities to some degree live in silos where, where they're, they're in the, the product of providing education, not necessarily helping industry and CSIRO seems to go through uh, a, a regular reformation every few years and food somehow keeps coming out. But, uh, you know, if you were standing outside that and didn't have to worry about what your superiors might say, would, do you think we've got the infrastructure uh, there you to...? Can, you can never escape them. But um, <laughs> a colleague, well, my a friend now is Jeff Garrett. He used to be CEO of CSIRO, but he always says if Australia only knew what Australia knows. And I think that goes for us in the, the knowledge sector in that we... We face more of a demand side issue around innovation than a supply side. We've got great innovation capabilities. There is definitely a need for more linkages to be formed between researchers and industry. And I think that's something that is continually being worked on and researchers with other researchers across the ins institutes. I reckon if Australia faces an innovation imperative that to respond to these trends, both in terms of mitigating the downsides and harnessing the opportunities, Innovation, doing stuff smarter and cleverer is a key part of it to, to achieve this jump to where we're going to be. I'm, I met with someone from a food retailer in China, a big food re retailer in China yesterday, and she was saying pretty clearly, yeah, we're a big opportunity, massive market opportunity, we know that, but you guys aren't the only ones supplying. We've got Chile, we've got Brazil, we've got, we got all these other ones queuing up. We can make the stuff ourselves as well. So it is an opportunity for you, but... It's, it's a matter of a, a lot of smarts, from business models to the science, to respond to this one. Richard, we seem to be coming around to the role of government and the role of policy. And, and I guess the, the interesting uh, question or the interesting point that's repeatedly made is, and we saw it in the discussion this morning uh, by uh, Gauss from uh, Rabobank, that the Europeans have certainly got a focus on creating clusters of industry and academia and research capacity in the one location with, a, with an almost seamless integration between industry and, and, and the researchers. Um, we certainly see that in the land-grant universities in the US where there's quite a deal of movement of academics in and out of industry on a regular basis, not you know, choosing career in academia or choosing career in, in the private sector. Do you think there are policy instruments around, for example, the way research is funded, the way universities funded, that can make it easier to get that integration between industry and, and perhaps even look at clusters like I know uh, certainly has been started in, in relation to the University of Tasmania? Yeah, look, I, th I think that's a, a really important thing, that, that, that flow of information. I, I hadn't heard the quote before, if, you know, if, if only Australia knew what Australia knows. And uh, I think that's one of our huge opportunities. Is, and we've talked about it a lot, even in the additional funding we've put into R&D. It's about collaboration. It's about... Uh, different area sectors working together 
uh, to ensure that uh, not only the work gets done as far as the research is concerned, the development's done, but also then the extension. And uh, I've had a lot of conversations over recent times, including um, in China when I've been there, India recently, about the opportunities that that brings. And I don't think to a large extent we actually understand what we have. So it really goes to Stefan's point that we don't understand what we have here in this country and, and what opportunities might flow from that. Uh, and uh, I think the way that we can set some of our policies can uh, set that up. The China Free Trade Agreement, for example, which is, is really good for agriculture in a commodity sense, the opportunities that that provides in a service provision sense, I think potentially could outstrip agriculture in a supply sense. I mean, the, the, the knowledge that we have around systems, uh, around uh, uh, quality management systems, the, the discussion in recent weeks, for example, around berries out of China. Uh, we have QA systems that operate in this country, something like fresh care, which we could actually take to China. We could take the skills of applying it, implementing and training people up. That can be a service provision process. Um, and uh, that provides that, 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 that's the sort of system that's going to provide su su surety in the supply chain as far as food, sa food safety is concerned. We're not going to test it to provide that surety. You can test it to death and you'll still miss things, and that's proven by that current circumstance. So I think working together on those sorts of clusters um, really does provide an opportunity that was really pleasing to, say that, to see today the collaboration with universities around the way that they establish their curriculum. I mean, we're not standardising anything, but they're setting the key parameters um, for the industry. Uh, and, and so I, I see a real opportunity in that space. Yet engagement between industry, that is the major, some of the larger corporate players, for example, um, whilst it seems that, for example, the mining industry has established quite strong links, and they've obviously got uh, big licks of dollars to do that. It doesn't seem to happen that much in, in the agriculture and the food industries. No, so look, I think, I think that's right. Um, but again, that's, uh, that, that concept is something that we can look at in the, in the development of, our, of the white paper. I mean, that, that sort of demand for the higher skill set that I talked about at the outset, you know, younger, smarter, um, high, more highly educated, tech savvy farmers doing uh, more on larger farms with less labour, all those sorts of things, it's going to be an absolute necessity for those collaborations mm. to be working. It's starting to come through in the numbers now. We're starting to see that. And I think that we really need to stop talking about the agricultural sector in the terms of the 55, 60 year old plus aged farmer, because it is really starting to change. Uh, but to ensure that we continue to get that level of um, attraction to the industry, uh, we need to be talking about it in much more positive terms. The fact that there's an opportunity for a career um, an exciting career in agriculture, uh, providing the leadership that you know, Matt's group promotes uh, is really important. Uh, and that close level of collaboration, there's some work being around the, the food industry hubs, for example. So they can be the commencement of that process and there's some good collaborations that are starting to be built out of that. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges I think emerges from this is in some respects the disconnect or the difference between for example, the preferences of consumers in a nation like Australia, where they have the luxury of uh, cheap and readily available food and, and therefore society sets uh, a degree of standard associated with that comfort, if you like, so with a focus on things that we all know, animal welfare and safety and all that sort of stuff, versus servicing a market in an emerging country where the demand is actually for, for cheap protein or the demand is actually for uh, a reliable supply of protein um, rather than necessarily um, uh, some of the, the fussiness that, that our consumers uh, uh, exhibit here. I'm, I'm wondering if any of you have thoughts about how does, how does agriculture get the space from, from our own social licence here in Australia to actually be able to service those markets? Have you? wondered about that or thought of any brilliant solutions to that, Richard? Um, 
It doesn't really matter what market segment you're talking about. One of the big issues that we have in Australia with our environment is consistency of supply, both of quantity and of quality. You know, we're land of extreme weather events um, and our production goes up and down accordingly. Now, whether or not you are trying to produce a, a, a high quality market where the consumer is expecting the same quality every time they go to the supermarket or whether you're supplying a, a high throughput low cost mill in Asia that has all the machinery tuned up to you know, operate on a, on a certain quality. Um, maintaining quality is really, really important. Now, um, to some extent, I think the supply chains that have developed, and I'm particularly talking about the grains industry here, um, post AWB have diminished our ability to do that. Um, that's why CBH is so popular, you know, that they, they're still of a size and an ability to, to manage that to some extent, to take shocks out of the system. Um, the East Coast syst um, system, though, is, is failing to some extent in that regard. So I think, uh, you know, really paying attention to our, to our supply chain so that we can take uh, quality and quantity shocks out of the system to maintain supply into any market segment is really important. Matt, your experience with the National Farmers Federation and, and being at the forefront of some of those debates around uh, social licence and, uh, and what standards are acceptable here versus what uh, might be uh, uh, demanded by consumers in developing nations. Do you have any insights from that about uh, the best approach the industry takes or to make sure it doesn't... I mean, I guess I'd, I'd use the example of the UK. Uh, I think that's a classic example where the UK has gone in the post-war years from a nation that basically supplied its own foodstuffs and exported to one where now there's projections of over 50% of its food supply being imported. And if you look at the big changes that occurred there, they changed around things like foot and mouth and some of the um, more restrictive requirements around environment and animal welfare, mm -hmm. where whether the society knew it or not, they were uh, 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 setting themselves up to become major importers of products from Eastern Europe mm -hmm. that didn't have those same standards. So mm -hmm. I wonder whether, whether you've, you've had some thoughts about mm -hmm. how, how you avoid that sort of scenario playing out. Yeah, it's an interesting one, Mick, and we talk about um, Courage is a real requirement in, 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 uh, in any sort of uh, leadership field, and I think this is one of them. Um, and I, I, I guess I reflect on this by saying that um, what we've generally tried to do, Mick, is to approach and attack this on a, on a one-off basis. So either each industry or, or be it organisation, I guess, and, you know, I can certainly understand why in many respects people say, well, you know, this is an issue with this particular industry, therefore that industry needs, needs to deal with it. I guess what I'd, I'd say in to fact, that... In fact, some of the other industries have been happy, the attention has been directed. Well, that's also <laughs> true. That's also true. Um, and, you know, you were talking there before, I was just thinking about the parallels between that relationship between academia and government and, and private industry. Well, you know, here we are at, uh, at ABARES again, and you've all had a chat in the break and you've been making contacts and that's all fantastic. But I just wonder uh, how much actual cooperative work this industry, real, real cooperative work we, we start to do together. And, and I'm not talking about individual organisations or industries uh, missing out or, or going backwards. This is, in my mind, about value adding uh, and, and helping to support each other. And I think when it comes to the issues you've been talking about, uh, Mick, then that's really one area we need to do more on. So I know, Mick, you're passionate yourself about Brand Australia. And uh, to me, it's, a, it's an absolute no-brainer, but we've paid it pretty scant attention and we haven't invested in it. And people can sit here and say, well, why do I need an overall um, umbrella, umbrella brand when my product is the best? Well, well, I'd say look at New Zealand and look at some other examples and, and see what it can do. And by all means, build your brand underneath that. I think that's, that's an important element. I don't think our industries are doing enough uh, to work together and, and to have some level of co-investment uh, around consumer trust and building goodwill in the community. I've just talked about the, we've here the rise of the, the consumer. Uh, so individual industries are doing great jobs, uh, working together and co-investment in that area to build goodwill in the community 
we've been terrible at. I think people know what needs to be done, but we haven't had the courage to move that way yet. Um, Stefan, that cuts across in some respects some of your areas because it's all very well to have the best scientists producing the best technology in the world, but if the consumer won't accept that technology, if, if the industry doesn't have the social licence in a nation like Australia to produce that, then, then the market opportunities go begging, don't they? Does that, does that become an issue that CSIRO has to consider or that the, the research sector has to consider in terms of future technologies and what's possible? I think so. I mean, we've got to We've got to be more. We've got to be smart than more than just science or pure science. Maybe social sciences or broader business models have got to come into this as well. Now, one of the graphs in researching this that strikes me is this one here of dairy exports from New Zealand, and it's probably a data set people here are pretty familiar with, which is two Australia and New Zealand dairy exports being both pretty flat until around 2008, when the melamine milk crisis hit China. But they had a free trade deal on the 1st of October 2008, and their dairy exports do this. And the, the, uh, my understanding is, is that the New Zealand tag means healthy and fresh over there, and that's been communicated to the New Zealand customer, and despite efforts, that it's not going to change for a long time. China is going to like that New Zealand product. So that's the sort of thing we want to pull off. Uh, and it's more than just, just science. There's a, there's a big picture of it being smart that, that lets us achieve that. David, from an economic, uh, economics perspective, one of the commonly used comments around the, the conference over the last two days has been the globalisation of the food industry and globalised supply chains. Um, and I think we, we tend to let that trip off our tongue without thinking about the implications of it. And if we think about it in terms of, as, as one of the speakers did today, how the components of an Apple iPhone are put together, um, uh, I guess there's two questions. What, what, what role for Australia in that? Are we just a supplier of raw material? Um, and to what extent will those supply chains therefore dictate uh, most of the answers to these sort of questions we're discussing? Should we, should we all pack up and say, well, let's just attach ourselves to a supply chain because that'll, that'll give us all the answers in terms of the standards and the uh, technologies that are acceptable and all that sort of thing? Or am I being too bleak? It's a, it's a complicated question, Mick. Um, so, I mean, in, in a sense, that so globalised supply chains are, are in some ways not really new, right? They've been around for a long time, you know, since the British Empire. I mean, there's a very famous essay um, about nobody knows how to make a pencil because um, all the different bits of the pencil, you know, even back in the 1970s or whenever this was written, all came from different parts of the world and they all involved specialised technologies to you know, deal with graphite, to produce graphite, to produce the wood, to create, you know, to do all this. So it's not, I, I think these globalised supply chains are, are not particularly new. Um, I guess what we're seeing is that some of the implications of them uh, for Australia are sometimes positive and sometimes negative from our point of view. Um, I think what's interesting, very interesting in some of these supply chains, well, let me go back a step. W one of the things that's changed recently is that until recently, these supply chains have been largely invisible to consumers. So consumers have got no idea, on, in most cases, how things are put together and just how international any product is. Until we get a scare like the frozen, the frozen berries, where suddenly people realised that something had come from overseas and that it actually involved several layers of processing in several countries for something very simple. So until recently, consumers you know, are not really aware of most of what goes on in a supply chain. Uh, one of Stefan's trends um, that he talked about there was, I'm not sure the exact words, but this this idea of radical transparency in the whole supply chain. You can now, using all sorts of technologies, observe everything that's going on in the supply chain. And sometimes with bad intent. I mean, we've seen, uh, or, or with social intent perhaps, we've seen recently the extreme power of a hidden camera somewhere. Right, in a, whether it's a food supply chain for our live exports, whether it's a you know, greyhound training or whatever. Now, the technology and the ability to make those things transparent has is, is just exploded. I mean, you can not only you know, have your hidden camera uh, and then put it on four corners, actually you can have your hidden camera and stream it live to the world. I mean, you could be streaming this stuff live to the greyhound stewards. I mean, the, the ability for the technologies to make this stuff very transparent is, uh, is extremely transformative in Steph Stefan's words. The other word is disruptive, right? It's a very disruptive technology. And I think the implications of that, um, the complexity of our supply chains, 
getting back to your question about consumers and how consumers might perceive this, I think we're just starting to see how that may play out. And I think it's very hard to predict whether you know, it's going to make life easier or harder for Australian farmers. But as Stefan said, we should see it as an opportunity in the same way that the New Zealanders took the, took the melamine scares as an opportunity to, uh, to sell a product that was already a you know, well-established good product. Um, I guess part of that question is, is not so much the fact that there's globalised supply chains, but, but who are the captains, mm. if you like, of those supply chains? And, and we've had that discussion in Australia that in terms of dealing with some of these challenges, uh, a Fonterra-like organisation uh, that has the, uh, the wherewithal to actually do something about some of these issues, uh, as distinct from individual farmers who who uh, are more or less captives of the supply chains they're involved in. Um, uh, maybe that's the bit that's missing in Australia. I, I'd be interested in, in any of your comments about that. And, and obviously the ACCC is not listening just at the moment, so please feel free to express your opinion. It's very hard for Australian producers to collude on things like that, isn't it? And, um, <laughs> I'm not encouraging collusion. I'm just I'm asking the question, is the fact that we don't have uh, a champion consumer brand manufacturers mm. as part of the environment in the food industry in Australia, particularly if you go offshore. I mean, sure, we have some recognisable brands here in Australia, but we don't really have the degree of penetration of consumer brands offshore that, for example, I mean, Fonterra does. That's, that's one of the, the trade-offs of agricultural marketing in the past in Australia, is we've chosen to market brand Australia, which isn't actually necessarily a brand. I mean, that gets to the point. It's not a brand that any one organisation can get a return from. So no one can get a return from it, in a sense. Either everyone does or no one does. And one of the trade-offs in the way that we've done that in the past is that there is no, no single brand, aside from one or two. Um, and it, it's just a trade-off, and it's something that, that um, producers need to think about, uh, and, and people elsewhere in the chain need to think about whether that remains an appropriate thing, you know, approach in the future, given what we know about some of these trends. Richard, uh, obviously that cuts across the political sphere as well when you've got issues like the role of CBH in the grain supply chain in Western Australia, your questions around the, the future of the Sunrise model and structure, and even issues around Murray Goulburn and, and you know, whether it expands beyond just the cooperative model uh, to get that sort of global scale that, that, that gets it into those markets and with consumer products. Is that do you think that those issues are dealt with in sufficient real-world knowledge uh, by our, our policies and our structures at the moment? Look, I think it's one of the real emerging questions. Uh, the situation that Murray Goldman find themselves in right now, where they're looking for that next level of expansion, how that fits within the cooperative model. Uh, I've already had some conversations with them and others around what we might do uh, to enable our agricultural sector to work together in a collaborative sense to, to build some of those supply chains. I think supply chains are going to be one of the critical questions of A, meeting the, uh, the food task more broadly, but how we participate in it from, a, from an agricultural, from a farming perspective. Because those who control the supply chains uh, stand to gain significant benefit out of the value of the product going through them. And there's no surprised that all big companies like Coles and Woolworths over a period of years have invested heavily in their supply chains and they take dividends out of the supply chain from various parts of it as they as product moves through it uh, and that's why we've seen a change in the value of proportion of retail price at farm gate return to farm gate so it becomes part of the value add proposition uh, and we're putting different products into the market value adding them as we go and the, and, and those who participate in that process are taking a piece of the end retail price in proportion to the farm gate price as part of that process. I think that's one of the big questions that we have to answer. The opportunity for farmers to earn more at the farm gate will de determine, be determined by the management and control of supply chains. I've had international investors coming to talk to me and they want to buy supply chains. Now, it's a simple answer as to why they want to do that, because that supply chain gives them the opportunity to take dividend uh, returns uh, as the product works its way to market. Uh, and so I think that's one of the real questions that um, governments have to, to deal with. 
uh, and also, but also the agricultural sector. I mean, to, to actually meet some of these markets, which are so big in scale, there's going to have to be some form of collaboration from an Australian perspective to do that. Individual farmers, horticulture, I think, which has been one of the um, plays in that space over a period of time, they're not going to be able to do it on their own. So how, how are, are, are products um, brought together to take out the supply variations and fluctuations that come through the natural agricultural changes? How do we modulate those supply variations in the supply chain? Uh, and, and I think that's starting to be done and we're seeing it manifest in some of the big multinational processing organisations. And the, the real question for me is how do we as a country play a, a, a part in that? I mean, to a certain extent, Coles and Woolies as big retailers are Part of, part of that function. They, they almost are um, uh, Australian champions, if you like, in that space. Now, we don't regard them as that in a lot of circumstances, but they are large Australian-owned businesses uh, and we ought to value that. The alternative is for them to be owned by um, somebody else. So that's an important part of the, the discussion. But how do we collaborate? How do we bring together that scale that allows us to, to work into those international markets and I think that's a real question um, that we have to look at in, in the way that we uh, look at and structure some of our business uh, models in Australia. And, and I guess the, the comment that's frequently made is in relation to your comments about Coles and Woolworth, yes they are in a sense brand champions but they've never gone offshore so unlike most international retailers of any scale, certainly any scale that approaches theirs, uh, where there are platform to exports as well as um, you know the service of the domestic market, we seem to have ended up locked in a domestic only um, set of brand champions in that respect. I don't see that as a long term prospect. In fact, I know having had conversations with them that they are looking at international markets. Uh, it's a matter of how they actually move into them, uh, uh, and and the conversations that I've had have been around them providing a platform which would allow. Australian farmers to access a supply chain using their model to get into a market on a um, an internet market basis. So there is, they are looking at those sorts of things. I've had the conversations, haven't necessarily manifested themselves yet, but I know that's something that they're looking at, and that is part of the value opportunity. I think um, as it comes to fruition, I mean Woolworths are in New Zealand, for example, so they are. Um, already, already starting to look out there, and uh, to a certain extent, their growth is going to d depend on that as well. There's, there's, there's natural growth within the, uh, the Australian market, but they're under pretty significant competition themselves uh, from international players coming in. Uh, Costco, Aldi has gone from, I think, about 10% of the East Coast market to close to 15 in the last four or five years. Uh, now, a lot of that's not coming off Coles and Woolies, but, but Aldi are putting an enormous amount of pressure in price uh, and product offering into Coles and Woolies. I know who the processors that I talk to are looking to for, the, for those sorts of pressures, and so are Coles and Woolies, it's Aldi. And yet they're sailing along nicely under the radar while the other big guys take all the heat. Um, so you know, they have to be looking at some form of diversity uh, if for their own business growth in the same way that the opportunity that exists for Australian farmers through things like our free trade agreements and market access agreements is that if they're not happy with the offering that they're getting from the supermarkets at home, the opportunity to go to a different market and earn a better return or better conditions is the opportunity that's provided by the free trade agreements we're negotiating. So I think it's multifaceted, uh, but I, I'm happy to admit that I don't have the answer to some of those supply chain issues. And the visibility through the supply chain, I think through technology is one of the things that's going to continue to come and the customers starting to demand it. You see things like um, iPhone apps that we can tell you seafood, for example, what boat it was caught on, what, what method, what day, and that stuff coming right back through the supply chain. That exists in North America, I'm sure it's coming here, uh, and, and you know, our choosy customers will start to demand it because issues around the efficacy of food, its provenance, all those sorts of things I think are starting to manifest themselves much more largely in the consumer's mind. Um, one of the, Stefan, one of the quadrants or, or circles you identified um, I think it was termed a bumpier ride, the issue of risk. Um, and I guess risk is, is we, we like to think it's something we're pretty familiar with here, 
And certainly when you look at our um, annual value of production or annual volume of production in agriculture at an aggregate level, it's a pretty bumpy line. Um, uh, uh, Richard, I'm interested in your comments uh, about from a business perspective, so running a business called farming. Uh, how big is, is risk in terms of your thinking and, and do you think we've got the policies and the arrangements in place that are optimum to manage that? It, it's huge. I mean, risk is, like I've talked about before, we, we live in such a, a variable climate, you just, risk is there constantly, no matter what doing, no matter what segment you're in, unless you're in, you know, chickens or pigs or something like that in a shed. Although you're still exposed to risk then because of the impact on grain price, I guess, and you know, feedstocks coming in. Um, I think it, it, uh, the people that are managing risk really well, and there are people that do it sensationally, that have just incredible discipline about uh, marketing plans, about sowing by date, about doing all these sorts of things that they are, will, are not prepared to compromise over. They'll have rules that they stick to um, that's designed to, to spread their risk as even as they, as they can. And, and generally, you'll find that they are bigger growers that have got the scale to be able to, to have that spread across a, a bigger area or a big amount of quantity. And so I think that's feeding into the, the statistics that um, we've seen here over the last couple of days, again, particularly in the grains industry, um, that the large farms are doing really well and continuing to do better. So um, I think there's, uh, I think the large farms are managing risk well. I think there is a big gap, however, once you get below that. Um, not necessarily in the understanding that risk is an issue, but just in the, in the business capacity through the size of business to be able to manage it appropriately. Uh, David, from an economist's perspective, uh, how, do you, how do you quantify and, 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 and understand better the, 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 the management of risk? Is there, is there an economist's perspective on whether there's policies or measures that might allow those things to be measured to be managed better in Australia or is it is, is it down to the individual businesses do you think? I, I think it's a bit of both I mean I think you'd have to say that, that good Australian farmers that's what they are they're risk managers I mean to, to have that you know you've got to have a lot of nerve to be able to you know get go through two or three bad years while your debt's building up and then waiting for the good year when you run down your debt if you're a good manager so they are risk managers uh, in economics we tend to think about what are the what are the tools and instruments to diversify that risk so that you don't have all your eggs in one basket, so to speak? And there and there are there are a set of tools available to farmers in terms of futures markets, contract markets. I've always thought anyone you know who owns a farm on the on the anywhere in Australia should also own a farm in Brazil or Chile because that diversifies your Southern <laughs> Oscillation Index risk, right? Um, but there's no reason why farmers can't diversified globally in that sense. Um, um, so it's a matter of are there tools to trade away risk in a sense and that means uh, to trade or really to trade with people who are prepared to take one side of the risk and you're prepared to take the other. Um, what are the means of actually fundamentally reducing risk rather than, than trading it away? So there's always something left over that we call you know non-diversifiable risk, risk that you can't trade away and I think that's largely um, technological. It's the it's the some of the technological trends that Stefan's talking about. It's the ability to integrate um, large data sets. Um, I think it, the report you know talks about some of the short term uh, forecasting that's available from the Weather Bureau. Um, constructing products around that that farmers can use. I think most farmers probably think that they're better weather forecasters in the bureau, and maybe they're right in their in their local areas, but we do know that these tools are becoming much more sophisticated. You can demonstrate in a quantitative sense that the, the forecasts are getting better and better, um, and you can demonstrate that that is actually a genuine reduction in risk, not just diversifying it. So if you know three months out what the weather's going to be like, you can avoid you know, inappropriate use of fertilisers, for example, and stuff like that, which actually genuinely saves money. So I think the technological ability there to increasingly manage risk through through integrating lots of data sets, um, I think is there. I don't know if there's many, I mean, aside from removing any any restrictions, which I don't know if there's that many in terms of diversifiable risk, that's sort of the role of, of, of government, I guess. Um, but the rest is good, 
good science, good R&D to, to actually reduce risk. Uh, Richard? Just, just want to come back briefly to um, one of the points I made um, in uh, my opening discussion about diversity in farming systems helping risk as well. Because I think that's, a, again, a big um, um, compromise that we have in uh, very narrow cropping systems, in very narrow genetic bases through animal herds, that you are concentrating risk. And that uh, the more the more crops you have in there, the more animal types, you automatically spread risk. But there's not there's not the economic signals to do that yet. And I think we need to be be work out how we you know we can be better at doing that. Steph, I think we're also likely to see big jumps and leaps in the field of genetics combined with digital technology science too that helps mitigate that risk. I think you know, the, the issue you're bringing up there of what's the technological risk we can, we can break, it's, it's the field of genetics will do huge amounts. You know, the cost of mapping the human genome fell from a billion dollars to a couple of hundred dollars. That same exponential growth trajectory is going on in agriculture as well. And the data we've got here show how much genetics has taken off and genetics can cancel out drought, well, can reduce drought risk, it can reduce um, fertiliser risk, it can reduce a lot of the supply side in, in vagaries that we face. And yes, yeah, so I, I wouldn't just, I would put that into the picture too at how the risk profile changes. In some ways it's getting better. I guess one of the other messages coming out of this uh, conference and, and, and I guess it's been realised in, in discussions over recent decades is the changing nature of the farm population and how in effect, in effect there's a polarisation, uh, get big or get off farm income, I guess is, is, is a fairly crude summary of that. Um, that obviously has implications in a sense of meeting some of these challenges and the capacity of different parts of the agriculture sector to meet some of these challenges. Um, and it also has implications in terms of policy because, of course, if we're, if we're constructing policies to, to accommodate uh, one group of those, we won't necessarily be also accommodating the other. Uh, do you think there's sufficient, uh, and I'd ask all of you, do you think there's sufficient pa attention paid to the diversity that has now emerged in agriculture? We're no longer average farms where, where, where a whole range of different commodities and different scales and different motivations uh, for that matter. Matt, do you, I mean, in your experience in the policy setting arena, do you think that there's sufficient uh, uh, sophistication around uh, the nature of the rural population and the farm population and how that's changing over time and the capacity of them to respond to um, those sort of trends we're talking about there? It's an interesting question, Mick. How much attention is paid to that diversity in, in, uh, in policy setting? Uh, decisions, uh, I think, um, you know, I don't think that's the driving force of what's setting policy, to be honest, in, in, in my experience about about what that, uh, you know, particular population or, or the size of those businesses looks like. Um, you know, I don't think it has been forefront, uh, at the forefront of those uh, those policy setting decisions. So, so no, it's a case of um, uh, more looking at what's happening at, at a grouped up or, or you know, in global yeah. level, if you if you like, and then can can your business adapt or uh, change in order to to meet that? Is really, in my experience, has really been more the case. I would say, mm -hmm. Stefan, in terms of technology, um, it may well be the case that a lot of the technologies you're involved in really only suit the businesses of that perhaps 15 to 20 percent. That's accounting for about 70 percent of the production. Does that become a consideration in some of the thinking around? you know, what future technologies might be applied? I reckon the nature of technology, it's pretty all pervasive, especially digital technology, but it'll get right down to the small farm household. And we did a lot of thinking in this about does the, sm the farm household disappear? And we don't think so. We think that model is robust and stays and, and adapts to the, the technology as well. For Australia overall, I think there is a bit of a story though, you know, in the last sort of 40 years of agriculture, we had to get big or get out was the, was the thing they said. We've got to get a lot bigger um, to respond to these massive demand growth stories. We don't just want to send a couple of apples and oranges up there to China. We want to send big lots of it all the time, continuously, with supply chain reliability. So this, this we're looking at the beginning of another big transformative scale up in Australian agriculture. And that's uh, the challenges I see. Richard, if we look, let's look at the classic uh, 
risk issue that uh, the federal government certainly has had to deal with over the years is drought policy. Um, do you think we've got to the level where drought policy recognises the, uh, the differences, if you like, that, that the so-called uh, the bottom 20 or 30 per cent uh, are very secure in off-farm income and probably have the most drought resistant uh, strategy that you could imagine? Uh, the middle uh, uh, are under a bit of pressure, and, and, but yet most of the debt is in the top uh, 15 to 20 per cent. So the so-called debt crisis uh, is actually concentrated amongst those larger farms. So d do you think that's uh, considered well enough in some of the policies around things like drought? Well, they're the sorts of settings that we're looking at at the moment, particularly in the development of the white paper and where we go with those sorts of things. I'm not sure. It's not resolved. There's no question about that. Uh, and I'm not sure that you can necessarily uh, provide settings that look at a specific element of the industry. It's, the definition is too broad. Uh, I agree with Stefan. You're going to still continue to have uh, family farms because there, are, there is a distinct uh, economic value an advantage in that scale of operation. Uh, it might be bigger than what it used to be, but there's still a, a, a distinct advantage in that level of operation. Uh, it, it has its own risks, obviously, uh, but um, there's certainly a fair bit of thought going into the, the settings that allow um, the agricultural sector to manage the risk as much as they possibly can without too much government intervention. Uh, and I think the, the closer we can get to that quite frankly, the better. Uh, as we were saying before, the, the, the good farmers, they understand the cycles, they understand the risks, they have the hedging mechanisms, and there are a lot of um, uh, tools available for farmers to actually manage uh, risk on their, on their properties. Some do it better than others, obviously, uh, and that, but that's business to a certain extent. Uh, but uh, we're certainly looking at some of those key settings around the tools that uh, we can make available to farmers to help them manage that sort of risk. I agree with Stefan around the use of data and technology. I think that's probably one of the next um, infrastructure leap that will uh, come into agriculture and the utilisation of, of data, big data across agriculture in a whole range of ways that we probably don't yet understand is going to be one of the things that's uh, quite transformative, perhaps disruptive for some, but transformative. Uh, for agriculture in, in the short to medium term, particularly once we get our transmission infrastructure in place, and that's really vitally important from my perspective. David, as an economist, is there a perfect drought policy? <laughs> is there a, well, I like the, um, the phrase with minimal government intervention. I thought, of, I thought that was quite good. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, just, if, just go back, I mean, we're talking a little bit about the, the family farm and, and big farms. I mean, it's an interesting thing to try and understand what do we know about, you know, the optimal size of a farm. I mean, is it is it a, is it a big farm? Is it a small farm? And it may be the wrong way to think about it in some senses because technologies are likely to create opportunities for all of them. If you think about the business opportunities that have been created elsewhere through the digital platform, there's there's many many more small home businesses now selling on eBay or whatever than there, than there was previously because they can they can sort of get to the long tail, as, as it's called, of consumer demand. So they can find the one person in the world that wants the particular sort of cushion you make with the funny colours or whatever, whereas before you could never have found them. Right? And so it's interesting that that, in terms of creating, what does that mean for, for market structures? We see this growth of lots and lots of small firms. Many of the guys that make apps for the, for the iPhone and Android and so forth, small businesses. But we also see in the tech world ginormous firms. I mean, the biggest in the world, Google, right? The biggest firm in the history of humankind, right? Is is uh, is a Google, and you know, followed by an Apple. Um, um, but how does the Google expand? I mean, they actually expand by buying other small businesses. They're not actually, you know, they're not growing so much from within. They see a good idea and they buy it. So if you think about how this dynamic might work in um, Within agriculture, there's there's a huge number of possibilities, and I, I would have thought we we're still going to maintain this sort of very wide distribution of of farm sizes. That for some, and depending on the skill sets, family farm will be perfectly optimal. But for their other activities, a much bigger coalition of some sense, whether it's a single large firm or a bigger coalition mediated by technology, will be will be more appropriate. And then that that gets a drought policy because I think that as as these technologies allow this 
sort of integration and diversification across um, different activities. And I was quite serious when I was talking about buying a farm, you know, in Brazil. That's the ultimate drought policy because they don't have the drought. They, well, they've we got have a the major drought. drought at the moment. Uh, but not when. But normally, so crudely speaking, it's you know the El Nino. I know. But the point is, there's there's no way, there's no reason why instruments like that can't, te with the use of these communication technologies, developed from the bottom up, and would actually require minimal. Um, government intervention and the government intervention gets at what it should be getting at is the true social safety net which I think we all agree with in this country is, uh, is getting at you know cases of genuine unavoidable hardship for whatever reason rather than you know, distorting signals up and down the chain. Richard your minister for the day what's your perfect drought policy? I uh, don't have any. Um, I've heard is that you don't have any policy or don't have any Don't policy? have any drought relief support. I've heard Donald McGecky say several times now that um, the uh, amount of um, uh, the decline in R&D funding from all government sources over the last 10 years or so is pretty much exactly the same as the drought relief funding that, that's been given out. Now, it's just completely wrong. You know, we, we need R&D to help farmers become more resilient to get through drought, to change, to change practice. Drought relief to keeps people doing what they're doing. Doesn't it? Doesn't there's no mechanism in there to sort of in, in, um, bring on change. So I think we've got that completely round the wrong way. Um, so yeah, my <laughs> I, I, my personal opinion is I'll be getting rid of it. Let's hope there's not a drought in the Liverpool Plains this year. Yeah, I know. There's never drought there, Mick. <laughs> uh, I'm going to come to each of you. Uh, we're sort of getting towards the end of our time, and I'm going to come to each of you. And uh, basically, the question I'm going to pose is. You've looked at the work that CSIRO has done. You've looked at some of these projections about the, the, the five megatrends. Um, you know, what's your take out of that in terms of something concrete that should happen in the sector uh, as a consequence? Or perhaps your response is ho-hum, um, we'll, we'll manage on. I, I, I'm interested in your reaction. Do, do you, uh, and I won't start with you, Richard, because you've just been under the pump. I'll start with Matt, so he's got a bit of a warning. You know, looking at those trends, is there any surprises in them to you? And I guess the more critical question is, what would you do as a consequence? What would you do differently? What's the one thing that perhaps the industry needs to take away from this in terms of some concrete action in response? Well, Mick, in terms of are there any surprises in what I see there? Not, not particularly, uh, but obviously, you know, well put together in terms of where they, uh, those five areas intersect, I think is really important. You know, for, for me, I think there's, there's two things. I think every time we have a discussion about this, and probably Stefan, I know this better than anyone else, I think most people see these future trends as a really interesting aside. Uh, or something novel, but uh, gee, it's got not much to do with not me. Day day. Mm. I, I think um, one takeaway would be, uh, you know, what sort of investment might be required in in our sector uh, around the future thinking. You know, co continuing th this discussion and to be better prepared, whether that's at an organisational, individual company, uh, or industry level. I think that's all all pretty important. And the second thing for me is. No one. You say one? Go on. Anyhow, you know, I always take a little bit more, Mick. But um, I think this, the second thing really is around, um, and it's been said a few times, what, where, are the, where are the key areas that we should either work cooperatively or collectively? And I think it's been in a few areas that we've talked about today, uh, and have the courage to actually make a move in that area. Stefan, what would you do? You've had a lot of time to contemplate these issues. Yeah, right. So... Those two bottom mega trends of choosy customers and tra technology transformation um, are ones I'm thinking a lot about. And I think there is this big opportunity around digital technology and supply chains for Australian farmers to connect to the world and grow at the scale we need. And we really need it because, you know, the mining boom, let's face it, is kind of over uh, in a lot of ways. And that I went up to Mackay at the beginning of last year and the mayor was running Diversify Mackay and it was it's a bad situation as businesses are closing and unemployment is rising. Australia needs new industries and, and it needs its old industry, which is agriculture, to be the new industry as well. I think digital technology and this choosy customers one are a part of this. You know, I hope somewhere in Australia there's a farmer who is using social media to build this new supply chain for frozen berries. That they're making berries and they're able to capitalise on this and they're connecting to a retailer in, a, in Indonesia or South Korea 
who's talking to them well, and uh, they're organically solving this problem for us. Um, likewise, you know, um, a bunch of other producers across the system are doing the same. So as we've seen Uber, this concept of Uberization, which is becoming a, a noun or a verb now of, of what's happening in Uber is doing to taxi markets, digital technology will disrupt supply chains, but if we're smart with how we power it, and get on top of that one and drive it, we can get to scale on this one, and it's a real important challenge for the national economy. Uh, Richard, we'll absolve you from party room discipline. We'll recognise that what you say next isn't necessarily policy, but given that freedom, where would you go in terms of responding uh, to some of these issues? Uh, well, I was really quite excited when I was given the document to have a bit of a look at, because I'm also reading another fairly important policy document right now, and I now read them side by side. It's on white um, paper, isn't it? It's on white paper, yeah. Um, and, and I said at the outset that we need to be looking at our policy and our industry not in the review mirror but through the windscreen. And I think a lot in the past we've tended to look at the industry. We're looking forward but we're looking in the review mirror and we're looking at what's, what's gone behind us. And we really do need to seriously be looking into the future. We need to be considering... Uh, what's at the end of the supply chain and the person walking up and down the supermarket aisle, wherever they might be, what they're looking for uh, and what they're expecting through the supply chain. Um, the opportunities that are created by um, uh, big data, in fact, this document actually is a demonstration of that, pulling all of that information together to look at what the future trends are, where they might take us and how they might take us there is a demonstration of the value. I think of that, and I've already provided some feedback through the system as I've read through the document as to uh, how we might express some of this too. We, we, we spent a lot of time expressing the agricultural sector in um, a, a gloomy light. Mm -hmm. There are enormous opportunities, I think, this document helps to demonstrate what they are, and to a certain extent, I suppose I look at it as a bit of a benchmarking document for what we're doing as far as policy development is concerned, because we need to be looking out that way. Mm. So, you know, th this is quite informative for me in a policy development and setting sense. So, uh, it, it demonstrates the, the value in utilising the information that's out there, that's available, that a lot, a, a lot of us don't actually use. You know, the, the supermarkets, for example, have an enormous amount of information mm. about consumers and customers. How many people in the agricultural sector access that and use it? Um, it's, a, it's a valuable tool. The supermarkets use it all the time in what they're doing. There are some companies uh, that I've spoken to who do access and use that information. They know more about the supermarkets and how they operate and what their consumers demand than the supermarkets do, and they make money out of it. So I, I, I see this as a good document, uh, so, and, and particularly at this stage in proceedings, in a policy setting sense, for me, it's a companion document. Mm. Uh, David, I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I know that most of the audience probably thinks we'll get a completely rational economic uh, answer out of you, yet I also know that you run chooks in your backyard, which Absolutely, makes yes. no economic <laughs> sense whatsoever. It's got nothing to do with economics, Mick, it's just got to do with liking chooks. Um, <laughs> but in terms of, so in terms of um, uh, Stefan's points here, I mean, e each of those circles, if there's any students out there, every single one of them is a PhD, right? We could drill down infinitely. But in reading it, I was inspired to think about um, the transformative technologies bit, because it links with other work we're doing with the Department of Communications and uh, other portfolios. And one of the interesting themes in, uh, in economic research at the moment is trying to work out um, with these transformative technologies, two of them are which are machine learning, so this is computers learning things, so the Google car can drive because it's learnt a set of, a set of rules from people. Google Translate can translate, not because it knows the language, but because it's learnt by looking at literally millions of examples of translation. So this is machine learning. Uh, machine learning and mobile robotics, which Stefan mentioned before. So these are two really important things that are going on. And the, and the, and the robotics in particular, developments in recent years have just been phenomenal. So what you think of what do these mean for agriculture? And, and, and in economics, we tend to think, OK, um, what is it, if, if you do something that's the same as what a machine does, then you're stuffed, basically. Your returns will, will slowly reduce. And if you do something completely different to what a machine does, say you're an artist, machines can't do art, then you'll be fine, but you'll probably you know, 
sit there comfortably. But if you can do something that is complementary to what a machine does, so if, if your work is enhanced by the machine and the machine's work is enhanced by you, that's a two-way interaction, then they're the guys that are going to absolutely make blistering returns. Right? And so I was looking at a, at a piece of work that had been done out of Oxford University trying to work out which occupations in the future are likely to be replaced by computers. So, you know, they put a 0% probability up to 100% probability. And they do it by working out does a certain occupation need creativity, does it need social intelligence, which machines don't have, you know, can you perceive value, can you integrate things, can you persuade. Um, and I was looking at their study and, and what it said for agriculture, and the things that they think will be ultimately replaced by computers, it's a really interesting list, animal breeders, so apparently that's something that's susceptible to machine learning. Agricultural inspectors, so people in the department here, uh, that's something that can be that can be susceptible to machine learning. Um, food and science technicians, and this is general across the sciences actually, the technicians, this is not the scientists, but the technicians themselves are susceptible to machine learning and, and, and mobile robotics. And of course miscellaneous, what we call miscellaneous agricultural workers, so they're the unskilled agricultural workers. They're you know, they're potentially, and we've already seen these trends. But who are the people that have a low probability of being replaced by machines? And this is this is really interesting list. It's it's things like soil and plant scientists, right? So there's so much involved in doing soil and plant science um, that the machine is complementary to those guys, and they won't be replaced. Uh, similarly, with am animal scientists, vets, um, food scientists, uh, environmental engineers. But really interesting for me, the one that came up on the list as a low probability of being replaced by a machine or a computer is actually the farmer. Right? Because the farmer, if you think about a good farmer, is actually someone that has to integrate a huge amount of information. His job or her job will be enhanced by computers but can't be replaced by them. And similarly, the computer technologies that we have will be enhanced by the knowledge of the farmer. So when I said before that most farmers think they're better forecasters than the Bureau, actually there's a reason for that. Right? There's a lot of local knowledge that they have that actually is complementary. So I think in the end I was trying to work out whether some of these me megatrends were a positive or a negative story for a, lot of, for a lot of agriculture. For the farmer, this is the good farmer that can integrate all of these things, it, it really is a positive story, I think. Uh, Richard. Uh unconstrained by the rules and strictures of a university and back running a farm, if you're running a grain farm on the Liverpool Plains, you look at these, are you, going to, are you going to get out of bed tomorrow and do something different? Are you going to think about your future planning of that farm in a different light? Or, or do you think, uh, you know, it's all just part and parcel of the noise around the daily decision making that uh, occurs on a farm? Where, where's your response? Certainly in the transformative technologies, um, and as a lot of people would know, I mean, I've always been into technology. I've, I've adopted a lot of technology on our farms over the years. Um, just to back up what David was just saying too, I mean, as someone that has been a very strong advocate, I, I love the toys, I love the tools, I love the technology, but you will never replace a farmer. And this is something that uh, a lot of the corporates are discovering in that you know, trying to introduce sort of generic management systems and thinking that well as long as you're a good manager it doesn't you know the, the, being a good farmer understanding the art of farming is not necessarily that important it is important and that's you know as, as we all know a lot of the corporates have found that out uh, to their detriment um, but overall look <laughs> to be perfectly honest I think that uh, we're well down the track on a lot of these megatrends I think you know, we're, we're, um, I'm a Nuffield scholar, I'm very fortunate in getting to see returning scholars present each year, having been around the world, seeing what's going on, you know, full of the latest trends, technologies, practices from around the world. And for at least five or six years, I think, that almost all of them have been addressing these themes in terms of, of what they're seeing around the world. But they're addressing them, and again, all of those five, both in terms of opportunities and threats. Yes, there's opportunities, but in every one of those, there's a threat as well. And I think, you know, if I could sort of sum it up into to one area that we need to work on that crosses all of those, is we are still not winning the battle for hearts and minds in the general population. 
um, the anti-agriculture, whoever they may be, people are very good at using hearts and minds arguments. Agriculture tends to respond to that with logic and it, you're never going to win a battle for heart and mind with logic. We need to get better at winning the battle for heart and mind to retain our right to farm um, or it's just going to become more and more difficult. Okay, on that night, I think we might draw uh, to a conclusion. Uh, I'd ask you to firstly thank uh, the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation who've sponsored this work and this particular session and most uh, particularly our um, five experts and Richard, I included you in the expert list uh, <laughs> on the basis of your performance. So uh, I'd, ask you to, I'd ask you to thank our five experts as well. And uh, I'd now ask uh, Karen Snyder, uh, the director of ABARES, to uh, add her finishing touches, I suppose is the best way to put it, to, uh, to the conference. Uh, thanks, Karen. Thanks, Mick. Um, my finishing touches will be very brief because I know that I'm standing between you and drinks or departures or whatever else you may have on this afternoon. Um, but I did just want to say uh, thank you, first of all, to everybody for coming uh, and to all of our sponsors. I think we have had an in a very interesting range of subjects discussed over the past two days. Um, as you've heard many times, the theme of the conference was the business of agriculture, and we tried to drive that theme through all of our sessions. Hopefully, uh, we've been successful in doing that. I think we've heard some interesting uh, stuff around the, the global context, starting with our global overview session yesterday and the uh, global growth session today. Um, we've had good insights into uh, for the outlook for Australian production across our major commodity groups and around farm performance, the sorts of factors that are driving uh, the, the performance and the productivity of our farm sector. Other topics we've touched on were investing in agriculture, opportunities in Northern Australia, the challenges of managing risk in agriculture, which have been well discussed here this afternoon as well. Issues around communicating food quality, cutting red tape in agriculture, and future technologies, I think have all been interesting topics of discussion. Um, and finishing with this session, which I think has been an excellent uh, summing, summing up of, of, of many of those trends that are driving the future of agriculture. So I think I go away with a um, fairly positive um, outlook. There's strong global demand. Uh, we have a reputation in Australia as high quality producers. Um, and we're working hard on getting the policy setting, settings right that uh, are going to allow us to take advantage of that. So I won't, really, I won't say any more than that other than again to thank our sponsors and all the people who uh, contribute to making a successful conference and they include Obviously, our speakers and our chairs um, and our staff from ABES who work very hard to pull off a big event. So thank you again uh, for attending Outlook 2015. And I look forward to seeing you back um, on, I think it's the 1st and the 2nd of March 2016. So travel well home and thank you again.